welcome everybody and uh, we'll commence this uh, this session on the global perspective on citizen science and open science and i want to welcome you all and thank you all for being here and particularly those people who've had to get up at unearthly hours or uh, whatever to, to to be with us tonight <clears throat> Now, the reason that we're running this session is because, um, well, citizen science and open science have both been, both movements that have been going for a number of years now, and they've both been developing and growing and evolving. Um, and it's evident to, to all of us that um, citizen science has benefited enormously from what's happening in open science. And we believe also the, uh, that citizen science is con contributing value to open science. So when a few months ago we were invited by UNESCO um, to draw together the global citizen science community to make a contribution to their process of consultation um, to develop the recommendation which is going to be launched in 2021 we were delighted to do that and, and when we looked at it we thought well this is a very a very good time to step back and to actually see what's happening in both citizen science and open science um, so we thought it was a very good time to do that and when we put out a, a call to our through our global networks to see who was interested in working with us on that we were delighted at the response we got um, and we also were very pleased because within our practice we have uh, now got good success in terms of um, working co-creatively and working with people and encouraging um, a very open way of going about things so we have set up a, a community of practice under the auspices of the Citizen Science Global Partnership. And that, um, that community of practice has been based on the, uh, the structure and the, the sort of framework of the We Observe communities of practice that have been, we've heard about this week, uh, which, are being, which are working so successfully in Europe. So um, we've set that up and uh, we've had our we've done our first we've developed our first short paper for UNESCO and we've also had our first workshop which was really good um, <clears throat> so we've begun the process but what we thought was because X's conference is now that this would be a really good opportunity for us to get together with you and um, to invite UNESCO uh, to come and talk to us um, and, and, and describe to all of us what this process for the recommendation is and also what they're hoping will come out of it at the end. So we're delighted to have Anna Persick with us today who is, is the a Director of Programs with UNESCO and she's going to be our first speaker. Uh, we're going to have uh, three speakers and then um, a, a question and answer session and then four more speakers and another question and answer session. So if you do have any questions as things go on, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them either in this session if we can or, or later if that's not possible. So um, with no more ado, I'll hand over to Anna. You're very welcome with us here. We're very glad to have you and to hear more about it from you, from the horse's mouth, as it were, um, and hear all about the UNESCO uh, great um, initiative in terms of the recommendation on open science. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Libby. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you very much for uh, for organizing not only this particular session, but also really for working very closely with us uh, in this endeavor uh, of creating a UNESCO recommendation on open science. 
it, it has been really, really important for us to have you on board and it's great uh, to, to have you, Libby, and your colleagues always ready, Uta also always ready to respond to us and to find the speakers or respond to our questions uh, as we move on in this, in this process. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope everything will work, uh, maybe from the beginning. Here we go. I hope it, it works well now. Good. So yes, I'm very happy to be able to give you a little bit of an overview uh, about this UNESCO recommendation on open science, which as Libby said, if everything goes well, uh, we are hoping that the member states of UNESCO would uh, uh, adopt in November 2021. And my name is Anna Persic. I work here at UNESCO in Paris. I'm the chief of section for uh, science policy and partnerships in the division of science policy, uh, and science policy and capacity building. And uh, um, in, uh, in, in UNESCO, you know, it's an organization, of course, uh, that deals with education, science, uh, culture and communication. We are, our section is, is in the natural sciences sector, but in building this recommendation, we work very closely with colleagues from different other sectors, education and communication and information, and also social sciences and natural sciences, because we see open science as something that is very much uh, going across uh, the different uh, borders, uh, including with regards to, you know, disciplinary or sectoral uh, borders of, of science. So, um, just uh, to give you maybe just a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a kind of background into why UNESCO got into um, open science is that, of course, we've been seeing uh, across the world this movement uh, that calls for opening uh, science and scientific knowledge and the scientific process and practice uh, uh, more, not only among scientists, that there is need for uh, opening science for the sake of scientists, but also uh, for the society and to have um, scientists work more closely with citizens, uh, with uh, other knowledge holders uh, to be able to um, uh, advance in the scientific process and also uh, be more relevant uh, for society in certain instances. So we do understand that the question is no longer if open science is happening, it is how it's going to happen and how do we make sure that it can contribute and benefit uh, to everybody and that there is no risk of actually this transition to open science basically um, 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 having uh, uh, causing uh, even more discrepancies between the South and the North in terms of science, technology and uh, innovation. So as I said, for us, um, we see open science uh, as, as, a, as a tool that allows, or as a, as a movement, let's say, that allows scientific information, data and outputs to be more accessible and uh, uh, more reliably harnessed with the active engagement of all the stakeholders. So as we said, you know, it's uh, science for scientists, but it's also science for and with society. And from the UNESCO perspective, one of the critical reasons why we got into um, uh, uh, the work on open science is that from different parts of the world, particularly from the South, uh, open science can really be a true game changer in bridging the science, technology and innovation gap between and within countries and also fulfilling the human right to science. So this is kind of maybe where UNESCO is really coming into, the, into play uh, to ensure that open science really does bridge the gap between uh, science, technology, innovation between countries and that it fulfills the human right to science. And we also see it, you know, in the UN context and in the global context, uh, you are certainly aware of the um, United Nations um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we do see open science as uh, a, a very important accelerator towards the achievement of the SDGs. But we also uh, see that there is a very fragmented scientific and policy environment when it comes to open science, and there is lack of a global understanding of the meaning, opportunities, challenges, but even risks of open science. And that's why in uh, November last year, our member states, the UNESCO member states, 193 member states, asked UNESCO 
to develop an international standard setting instrument on open science in the form of a UNESCO recommendation on open science. So when we talk uh, about the UNESCO recommendation, we talk about a global standard setting instrument, a legal instrument um, that, uh, uh, um, that can be um, uh, developed and adopted uh, by uh, UNESCO. Uh, a UNESCO recommendation, as I say, is a legal instrument in which the, the, the general conference formulates principles and norms for the international regulation of a particular question and then invites member states to take legislative or other steps to basically um, implement the, the, the instrument and apply the principles and norms uh, within their respective territories. So it, it, it is a very important piece of um, uh, legislation, let's say, from regula international regulation uh, that, um, uh, is, uh, th that we are hoping also will be useful to advance open science uh, more broadly. Uh, one of the things that our member states were really clear on, clear on is that they want the, the, this, this process of, of developing the recommendation uh, to be as inclusive, transparent and consultative as possible. And from the beginning of our discussions uh, on open science, there was a clear understanding that there's a lot of actors involved and that we have to involve all these actors into our conversations. Um, the recommendation is expected to define shared values and principles for open science, point to some concrete actions uh, for open science, and uh, also um, these actions are mainly addressed to um, the governments, but they're also addressed to these different actors of open science. It's a two-year consultation process, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how it's, it's going. It is guided by a multi-stakeholder open science advisory committee, but it has this overarching open science partnership. Um, and we are happy uh, to have citizen science partnership also as part of our partnership. And we really are hoping that, you know, it's, it's not just because we need to develop the recommendation that we want to put the different actors together. It's also because once the, uh, the recommendation is uh, adopted, somebody has to put it in place, somebody has to implement it. So as Libby was saying about the community of practice for citizen science and open science, it's something similar that we would like to also do for open science globally. Uh, this is the process along the two years uh, for uh, the development of the recommendation. We are now some, somewhere in the, in the middle, let's say, uh, in the sense that um, we have done a, a, a huge part of consultations already and inputs uh, into the, the, the first draft of the, of the recommendation. Now, let's say, the, so the, the, let's say that the first part was all these consultations and inputs uh, for us to have a better idea of what the expectations are and what different communities would like to see in the recommendation. The second part will be once the draft uh, text is ready for people, member states and other actors to comment directly on the draft of the recommendation or the text of the recommendation. And we are indeed in the middle with the, uh, the, the draft uh, in its uh, kind of final finalization process, uh, let's say. So the, the timing of this meeting is also very critical because we can just take another uh, set of inputs from this group as well. Uh, so I was talking about consultations. Uh, we had a, a big uh, global online consultation which uh, went from March to July and I'm sure um, uh, many of people who are here have also contributed to that one. We got over 3,000 uh, inputs from uh, a number of countries. Uh, it was from international stakeholders, from, from individual stakeholders, institutional ones, regional ones. We really we got a, a broad, broad, broad input into our uh, global online consultation, which consisted of a number of different questions to get an understanding of what people intend by open science, how they practice it and what they expect out of a recommendation. Then we had a, uh, and are still having a series of regional consultations with Africa, Europe and North America, Arab states. Next week we have one with Asian Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean the week after together with Eastern Europe. So these are the regions according to UNESCO. Uh, that's why they are, they're, they're regrouped in this sense. There were some national consultations in, um, uh, in, in, in some specific countries, in Germany, in, uh, in uh, Pakistan, 
uh, Thailand and some other countries. Thematic or stakeholder consultations, uh, young scientists through the Global Young Academy had their own consultation. Citizen science, of course, through this event and also the provision of the inputs uh, that Libby was talking about uh, in the process, indigenous peoples, UN system. So it, it really, the idea was really, really to get as much inputs as, as, uh, as possible to help us draft the first uh, draft. And it is this advisory committee of 30 uh, experts who uh, help, is helping us shape the, uh, the draft text based on all of these different um, uh, inputs that we, that we, have, uh, that we have received. I just want to say one thing about the citizen science because in in various inputs the importance of involving citizens uh, in open science was very much um, highlighted the discussions we often have and i really leave it to you also in this instance to discuss a little bit is you know citizen science versus or together with participatory science more broadly um, because for those who maybe were with us in the European and North American um, consultation, uh, there was a lot of uh, people who were saying, oh, citizens, some people do not have the citizen's um, um, status, but still contribute to uh, citizen science as, as such. So some of, some of these issues maybe can be teased out also in your conversations uh, today. But there is no question that citizen science really is an important part of open science and in general engagement with societal actors beyond citizens uh, is extremely important in that uh, in that sense um, just a few words on this draft text as i said uh, we had uh, this advisory committee um, that looked into the different inputs from different uh, member states and from different partners met in July for the first time and approved the draft outline. And then now, as I said, we are working on a, on a, on a draft text that incorporates all of these different inputs from the different uh, types of uh, consultations. The idea is to finalize the draft by the end of September and then send it to member states and again, all the other partners for comments and for reiteration in a second, um, in a second uh, phase. Um, once we have the second phase also of the of the uh, of the draft then uh, uh, the let's say the last part of the of the process is for really member states then to negotiate uh, the, the last version of the of the text and that comes towards the end of next year uh, the second part of next year uh, in the current draft we have the preamble of course aims and objectives definition of open science core values and guiding principles areas of action and monitoring. These are uh, different chapters uh, as we have them so far. Uh, and I think that the contribution we already received from um, uh, um, the Global Citizen Science Partnership goes along the lines of, 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 of these, uh, of these uh, chapters as well. I think what is very important to highlight here maybe and to guide some of your discussions is these areas of action because we see that really as the most critical part of the recommendation. Of course, agreeing on the definition is important, but I think in general there is an agreement uh, about the definition of open science as being this movement um, that uh, allows for science to be more broadly accessed uh, and used as well as produced with different stakeholders and actors. Um, but in terms of areas of action, this is what we have uh, um, identified coming out from all these different inputs and this is promoting a common understanding of open science as one of the areas of action. Uh, developing and enabling policy environment, investing in open science infrastructures and services, and capacity building for open science, transforming scientific culture and aligning incentives for open science, promoting innovative approaches for open science at different stages of the scientific process, and promoting international cooperation on open science. And citizen science probably cuts across all of these different areas of action, but there is a um, there, there is a lot to be said on that, particularly in these areas around transforming scientific cultures, promoting innovative approaches for open science in different stages of scientific uh, process, which would 
then incorporate uh, citizen science and other knowledge, uh, possible knowledge systems um, in the scientific process. So if, um, if this can help you in your deliberations today and in the discussions, I think that will be very useful for us uh, as well. And again, we are very happy uh, to, to be with you today and that you are with us in, in this process. And as I said, not only while we develop the recommendation, but we really will count on this community of practice uh, that you, will be, you are building in terms of implementing the recommendation when it hopefully is uh, adopted by our member states. So I think I'm going to stop here. I hope I didn't go too much over time. And then um, I'll pass it back on to Lydie. Thank you very much, Anna. That was, that, that's really what we wanted. That's, that was excellent to, to get all the detail there. So um, really just what we wanted. Now, uh, our second um, presenter tonight is, is Francois Gray um, from the Citizen Cyber Lab in Geneva. Um, and I'm not sure whether Francois is going to be managing his own presentation. So can, Francois, would you unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Hey, <laughs> there you are, welcome. <laughs> yes, welcome. apologies, we had some <clears throat> connection issues, but... Uh... Thank you very much for making time for us. We know how difficult it is for you. Do you have a presentation or are you just going to talk to us? Um, I do have a presentation. Um, one second and I'll just open it for you. Um, uh, let's just see. I need one second while, while I'm... Um, Sorry. While you're doing that, I'll give them your bio. Well, a little right. bit that I've got anyway. Right. That Francois is a physicist with a background in nanotechnology and a passion for citizen science. He's been involved in many international and institutional collaborations, opening opportunities for citizen science, especially online. And um, he's come out he, today from the Citizen Cyber Lab. He's been te he's teaching a masterclass. He's got a workshop today, so we're very lucky that he's taking time out to come and talk to us. So thank you, Francois. Thank you, Libby. And uh, yes, apologies. It's a little chaotic switching from one Zoom to another. We have a workshop where half the class is in person and half the class is still <laughs> online in quarantine somewhere. It's quite quite an interesting situation to be handling. Um, so I hope you see my screen now and uh, I'll just share. So uh, I wanted to say a few words uh, about how we have uh, approaching open science and citizen science uh, for the SDGs in the context of a project that was just launched a few months ago with the University of Geneva, CERN, uh, CSIC, the uh, National Research Center in, uh, in Barcelona, Spain, Politecnico di Milano, University of Paris, and the UN Institute for Training and Research. Uh, now, just before I, I launch into a brief explanation of, uh, uh, of what we're doing in this project that links open science and citizen science with, uh, with the SDGs, which as you can tell from the name of the project is, is, is the core. Um, I'll say that at the University of Geneva for, for several years now, uh, I've been running a course on open science uh, at the undergraduate level and a course on citizen science on the, at the graduate level. Uh, and in fact, there's a very strong overlap between uh, the contents of these, these courses. Um, uh, citizen science, at least the way uh, we present it to the students here, is a slice of the open science pie. Uh, and it's a very interesting slice of that pie. It has some very interesting contents in it. Um, but it is sort of connected with the whole theme of open science. Um, we also, um, uh, we also in this program that we're, I'm running in parallel, we have a master's program on the SDGs, a dual degree uh, program uh, with Tsinghua University in China. Uh, and there also we really focus on the role of open science, uh, really as a way to share, um, uh, share thoughts about innovation uh, across borders. Uh, so open science, open source hardware, software, these sorts of issues uh, can provide a, a common framework for, uh, for innovation, uh, especially on the SDGs. Um, the, uh, 
the inspiration for this crowd for SDG project we just launched was a, an online coaching program we've done for a while that brings citizen science to bear on the SDGs, um, where, where we look at how the public can participate in measuring progress towards the SDGs. Um, this was actually a, uh, a comment uh, in, in nature a few years back uh, from our, our rector and the director of UNITAR uh, that there was an opportunity to have citizen science contribute to uh, the data challenge uh, of the SDGs. And so we've, we've focused on that in this project, uh, but going beyond just the issue of gathering data for the SDGs in particular for the indicators is the ideas of getting young uh, global innovators to actually develop citizen science projects that make an impact on sustainable development in, in one way or other. So just to give you one example quickly, so this is a group of summer students from an SDG summer school we run uh, as, as part of uh, these activities we, we have now on education for the SDGs using uh, citizen science and open science as a, as a core theme. So here the, the issue the students team wanted to work on was, was a challenge set by WHO, World Health Organization and ITU International Telecommunications Union on early stage uh, detection of cervical cancer using a phone app as part of a, a program called Be Healthy, Be Mobile. And the students had this idea, first of all, to make an app, and then they realized that was, that was going to be very hard to, to get people to use. So instead, they, they built on existing apps, uh, apps that exist for uh, tracking menstrual cycles. Uh, there are many in many different countries. Uh, and through the project, they honed in on a collaboration with a, an app in Argentina that happened to be uh, a fully open source platform uh, for this sort of um, menstrual cycle tracking. And they got in touch with the, uh, the programmers and part of the role uh, we had in terms of uh, the, the education process and the innovation process was really helping them uh, to figure out how they could take their project and adapt it to this open platform um, and, and thereby make uh, some sort of um, impact on health issues uh, in, in related to uh, some of the SDGs. Uh, so for students, uh, meeting open science as something that makes their ideas useful is, as we find interesting. And the citizen science element uh, here, I think is in a sense obvious, but, um, but uh, you know, around health apps, I think there's still a lot of work um, to be done uh, in, in developing uh, links between, uh, between citizen science and uh, open uh, platforms. Uh, so uh, the, the way uh, in this project that we, we plan to help young people uh, innovate, and in fact, people of all ages, but we've just launched a call for, for young innovators in the age groups from 16 to 26, so high school and undergraduates, um, that is to really bring uh, citizen science and open tools and open data uh, together through a, an innovation cycle uh, over um, about a year, uh, going from I, an idea gathering phase to an evaluation of those ideas. A few are selected through for acceleration in a workshop. A workshop would be happening here at CERN in Geneva. Uh, and finally, presenting the, the top results to possible investors or partners uh, at an SDG conference, and that will be uh, next year, for example. And this cycle will be repeated three times uh, during the course of this project, uh, and we uh, we expect to have um, uh, something like three to five uh, successful projects coming out of this cycle, uh, with many more going in uh, um, and uh, and developing through the cycle. And we've just launched uh, here at uh, EXA uh, 2020, we've just launched uh, in a uh, sponsored lunch, uh, our next challenge, which is on urban water resilience. So it's uh, at this stage, it's the gathering phase, gathering of ideas, a call for, for projects. Uh, and you can find it either on our website or there's other links available. Um, looking for ideas about how to tackle either lack of water or, um, or too much water, floods, um, as they affect uh, urban environments uh, around the world. And we've already got um, 
a couple of dozen uh, pitches where so the, 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 the idea is to pitch pitching on a platform uh, called Goodwall, which is a, is an independent uh, company, but they, it's a social network for a social good. Uh, so we've teamed up with them uh, to reach um, a broad cross section of youth around the world. Um, so that's that's what I wanted to share with you about uh, some of the ways we're trying to bring citizen science and open science tools uh, together um, and particular to focus on the SDGs. Thanks. Thank you very much, Francois. That, uh, that was great to hear what you're doing there. Um, diversity is the name of the game <laughs> with the work that you're doing, isn't it? It crosses all the boundaries. <clears throat> so uh, do I gather that you you need to go now that so you won't be able to stay for for a Q&A? Um, well, uh, it's, I'm <laughs> just show you. we have a, a bunch of students outside here. They're listening to oh. another talk at the moment and uh, right. uh, I don't know how that's going. I mean, if there's a question now, if anyone has, I, that well, might, or I, I don't want to break the rhythm though, up to you. The thing is that um, uh, one of our other, we've gone over time, both you, you and Anna are, are right. over time. So I'm suggesting that Leslie Chan, who's given us a video, right. that we leave that for the moment and, and that we, um, I ask Anne Bowser to, to talk to you and to Anna um, at the end of this first section. And then right. we'll go on to the other presenters later. And right. we'll, we'll talk, look at uh, Leslie's um, video We'll add it to the session things. Right. And could I ask you to do that? I'm happy to, Libby and Francois. We can um, just take a couple of minutes for your interventions. I'll focus on the cross cutting questions first, and then if you need to hop off and be with your students, that's completely understandable. Thank so, you. Anna said something about discrepancies between the South and North in science and technological innovation. And the idea of diversity was also a key feature of your talk, Francois. So from either of your perspectives, I'm wondering to what degree so far do citizen science and open science actually fulfill goals of broadening access and diversity? Did, uh, either of us? Yes, if you'd like to come in first and then Anna can give her thoughts. Um, yeah, so so uh, I would say um, to the example I illustrated, um, we, what's interesting about using the SDGs as a starting point for discussing citizen science um, and open science is uh, that we uh, automatically get uh, actually a very large um, uh, we always have a majority of women in our classes, uh, you know, applying and so on. So it's something about the theme. Uh, and then uh, we do have this very uh, diverse, uh, internationally diverse uh, recruitment process for, for the activities we do. Um, uh, so this, this platform I mentioned, Goodwall, uh, reach, has partnerships with uh, organizations like the YMCA, the International Olympic Committee, uh, but also local uh, groups in countries like Nigeria, um, and so uh, so we we um, we've we we're, it's not that um, uh, open science automatically means diversity, but we find that uh, the SDGs as a theme for open science uh, creates um, a lot of opportunity for uh, diverse contributions. Uh, so, so that, that works uh, surprising. Actually, I have to say our main problem is at the moment not enough men in our classes. Um, and so, so that's a nice problem to have in a sense. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that would be my input. That's interesting and helpful. Thank you. Um, so partnerships and then also aligning with local groups. And uh, a thought on citizen science and open science as opening the door, but that in itself not being sufficient. Uh, Anna, do you have anything to add or any complimentary thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, in the discussions that we've had so far, uh, particularly on the principles, you know, on open science, uh, diversity is actually one of the key principles or guiding principles or values, as if you wish, that comes out with open science. At least the, the expectation of open science is to increase diversity and diversity in, 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 in all kinds of different ways. So, of course, uh, we can talk about, you know, um, increasing gender equality, uh, but also um, giving voices to uh, those who have historically been marginalized and whose voices, including in, you know, um, science and in um, pr production of scholarly knowledge more broadly, um, has not been, have not been heard. So diversity is definitely for open science, at least from our perspective, something extremely important. Uh, and then for, for me personally, I feel like uh, citizen science is kind of diverse by definition and, and including citizen science into open science uh, just increases uh, this diversity that we've been talking about for open, open science, including in terms of, you know, themes to, to study for research projects. Uh, what is the thematics? What is the different uh, procedures? What is the ways of inquiring? Uh, how do you uh, how do you arrive from a hypothesis to a, to a result? How do you then evaluate it, etc.? So diversity really in all the different parts of the scientific uh, process. Thanks very much for that answer. And I know we're almost back on schedule, but I do have one more question for you, Anna. Based on where we are in the consultation, from your perspective, what are the most important aspects of citizen science to address in the UNESCO recommendation or a similar policy instrument? I, I kind of feel it's the other way around, meaning that uh, I, I've, I've presented to you where we are in our thinking of open science, and it would be great if from this group we get uh, what is important for citizen science. Uh, as I said, for us, citizen science is really important because it makes this link to society, it makes this link to diversity, uh, it makes this link to, you know, societal impact of, uh, of science more broadly. Uh, it improves the quality of science, it improves also the way the science can be criticized and critiqued because it's more open, it's more broad, but then what exactly does citizen science need or what kind of actions for citizen science are needed, this is something that would be great if this group can come out, uh, come out with rather than the, the other way around. You are the experts more than we are in this field. Thanks for that response and thanks for being open to our perspective and thanks to everyone here who has joined the citizen science and open science community of practice to work with UNESCO on providing that feedback. I'll note for Anna especially, there are a few questions in the chat. Martin Brocklehurst asked about the relationship between the UNESCO process and other UN processes, including those from UN Environment. So feel free to address those in the chat, Anna, or we can get you a transcript of them later on. But for now, I believe I'll turn the session back over to Libby and then return to moderated discussion later in the session. Thanks very much, and that's that's brilliant. Um, right, we on to the second session of um, presenters, and what we've done for this uh, th this workshop is is to to invite a, as diverse a group of um, a, as diverse a group of, of people as we can with different perspectives. So um, in this in this session. Oh, sorry about that. I've got the wrong. Hang on. I do apologize. You have to forgive me for a moment. Um, <clears throat> so we've got four different presenters now um, who come from very different practices um, with very different um, experiences and expertise to bring to us. So I'll just tell you a little bit about each of them and then we'll go into their presentations. Um, first of all, we've got Mariana Varese and as I've al already said, uh, we're hugely thankful to her for getting up in the middle of the night to be with us. She's actually in Peru and she's the Wildlife Conservation Society's Director of Amazon Landscapes. And she also coordinates the citizen science for the Amazon Network. 
She's an economist with over 20 years experience in conservation in Latin America and the Amazon and is con concerned with evidence-based and participatory planning approaches for conservation. And uh, Joan, uh, Joan is from Catalonia um, with CREAP and uh, a lot of us will know him for his, his work as a researcher and GIS developer. Um, interested in data standards and interoperability, working with GEO program board. But he's also interested in behavioral, ecological and socio-economic tools for modeling agricultural policy. Um, and then we go to Pen Yuan Singh from the UK, from Durham. He's um, co-founder of the Mammal Web, which is a citizen science wildlife monitoring project interested in the intersection between conservation science and civic engagement. Um, he's also an active proponent, proponent of free culture, which I hope he tells us about, and open science, having edited guides and open publishing, and being among the first to receive certification from the Creative Commons on open licensing. And he could talk a lot about various things, but I've specifically asked him to talk to us a little about what he knows of open science and citizen science in his home country of Taiwan. And then last but by no means least is Shannon Dosemangan. Um, she's a Shuttleworth Foundation Fellow working on the Open in Environmental Data Project, co-founder of the Public Lab, which you probably will have heard of, and executive director uh, from 2010 to 2020 a steward of the Gathering for Open Science Hardware and co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Open Hardware um, and previously chair of both the US EPA National Advisory Council on Environmental Policy and Technology and the Citizen Science Association. And she's building the field of community-based science and in doing so bringing an ethos of hands-on do-it-yourself exploration and monitoring to the environmental justice movement. So as, as you can see, we've got a, a, a huge range of different um, people with different perspectives to just ho hopefully to give us an idea of all the different kinds of things that we can bring together with this work, which is why it's so exciting. Right, so um, um, Penn, would you like to take over the screen? No, sorry, it's Mar Mariana first. I do apologize. Mariana, would you? Can you um, take that's over? fine. You, you're there. I, I can um, let you know when to move um, okay, forward. Okay, I'll do that for you. I'd be happy to do that for you. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much for, for having me here. I will tell you about our citizen science for the Amazon network. And I will describe the network, the rationale and the design and use it as a context to uh, sharing some progress and thoughts about uh, synergies or point of contact between citizen science and open science. Next, please. So our network, uh, next please. Our network creates and shares knowledge in an accessible, trustworthy and timely way with the ultimate goal of informing management and policy decisions. We are over 25 partners from different backgrounds and seven countries. And all of us work on freshwater systems from different perspectives and interests. It's important to note that the partners of the network have their own area of influence and lead collaborations with a total of over 100 citizen scientist groups. So we are somewhat of a network of local networks. Next, please. We focus on Amazon freshwater systems and started with migratory fish because fish are sentinels for the basin's connectivity and are critical for rural and urban people livelihoods and also connect people with the ecosystem. Next, please. But the Amazon is huge and diverse and complex. And the challenge for us to reach scale was to create a common thread that connected us all. So uh, next, please. We defined a common question at the scale of the basin, at the large scale, that is general enough to gather multiple stakeholders around it, 
but it is simple enough that enables weaving other local questions uh, around it. And uh, we build a, a lot of our work is building from the knowledge, capacities and experience of our partners and then reaching out to other expertises uh, to build the solutions. And we, in that way, we designed and adapt solutions that are catered to the Amazon context and are constantly learning. So our, our learning is a, a big uh, issue for the partners. So since 2017, when we started thinking about this, we have agreed on guiding principles, on variables, on data collection protocols, terms of use of data, crediting contributors, and protection of privacy, among other issues. Next, please. So from now on, I will um, share a few thoughts using our guiding principles and progress to structure uh, my thinking. I, I hope it works. Uh, the first guiding principle I want to highlight is our commitment to scale. Uh, scale is what brings us together. Each one of us or many of us have a long history of local work with community-based monitoring and management or community science but we want to reach scale to understand fish migrations in this case. And scale, I think, is a very important uh, point of contact between citizen science or community science and uh, open science. Open science helps us to reach scale and to share data and knowledge at larger scales. Next, please. This slide, the slide that um, Libby will show next, is an example of data on fish observations we have been able to gather and aggregate in the last few years. But what we have been able to aggregate and share has, it's, a, it's just data of observations. What fish did you fish when and where? We haven't been able to scale up sharing other sorts of important knowledge on the ecology and the natural history of fish because here we are dealing with multiple ways of knowledge and with the next principle I want to discuss. Uh, next, please. A second important principle for us, and this is common to citizen science, is the um, embracing and valuing different ways of knowledge from mainstream science, professional science, accredited science, <laughs> to indigenous local traditional knowledge, and also to citizen scientists' expertises and perspectives. And uh, um, embracing this uh, generates some tension with uh, sharing knowledge at a larger scale, because sharing knowledge at larger scales require homogeneity. And we, um, that comes into tension with diversity of knowledge. Another big tension that I think the open science field can address is the issue of recognizing and giving appropriate authorship, intellectual property and uh, credit to non-mainstream scientists in the process. And this is something we need to value. And third, uh, next please. Uh, another uh, point of tension we have encountered is the issue of openness versus the protection of uh, privacy and other rights of participating citizens. In our network, we have layered it. We call it a scaled approach. The larger the scale, the less, um, the more blurred the data that is shared. And this is a precautionary approach, but it you can see also a contradiction or a tension between trying to foster open science, open knowledge with the issue of protecting the rights of participating citizens, especially in indigenous local traditional communities. Um, next, please. Um, one last uh, thing that uh, uh, we were discussing actually yesterday with other colleagues is the issue of um, one important issue for open science to help democratize and level the field, I call it, and address inequities in uh, global inequities in terms of power and access to information and knowledge 
is the issue of acknowledging, recognizing, and legitimizing data and knowledge generating by non-mainstream scientists as, as valid. And uh, this is still something that needs to be addressed. And I think this uh, consultation is, it could, could contribute to that. And finally, just to, to finalize, um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, I think the, the, the main, I have several ideas, but the main one I want to, to think about is the issue of, of inequities. Because open science and open knowledge sounds great. I'm all for it. But those who enter the game, if you, I'm an economist, so bear with me. Those who enter the game with greater endowments, greater resources, greater time to allocate to sharing, uh, capacities, money, uh, have a better chance of taking advantage of open science. And it may help reproduce inequities in power, in access to knowledge, in, um, in leveraging in the value of your own contribution instead of leveling the field. And I think this consultation and this process can provide uh, insights to address this problem. It's like the devil is in the detail and in the implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, that was fascinating, Mariana. I really appreciate that. Um, we'll go on quickly now to, thank you. <laughs> you did it for me, Joan, <laughs> off you go. Okay, thank you for for uh, inviting me here. It is it is a pleasure. It is a pleasure, and uh, I would like to start with this diagram that we already saw. That actually it's illustrating that open science is uh, composed by many other open uh, characteristics uh, or components. No open data, open source, uh, open evaluation. Uh, one of the few that it's not saying open, it's uh, citizen science, I suppose, because we are assuming that citizen science is, is open by default. But uh, I would like, if I may, I would like to amend the diagram by saying that uh, there is another openness that is the one that I, you know, work uh, usually, that it's the, the open standards. And open standards uh, are, you know, documents and strategies that are free and publicly available that are designed in a non-discriminatory way that doesn't rely on license fees that are vendor neutral data neutral and they are based on consensus what guarantees that well, who is in control of the practice of these open standards is the community itself but in particular uh, i would like to talk about open uh, geospatial standards, that is my field, to enable multidisciplinary in uh, open science. And uh, since I work with the, with the OGC, and you know that, nobody will be surprised that I do that. So the idea is that open standards are the enabler for multidisciplinary open science, because your open data, your open hardware, your open source, whatever can be combined with other open hardware, data, source, and enable disciplinary science. Uh, why you can combine them? Just because they happen in the same place, uh, so they should be somehow related. It is all about breaking silos and working together, so it's about trying to integrate uh, disparate sources maintaining uh, the different departments, but uh, interoperating among them. And uh, uh, with open geospatial standards, we are enabling uh, multidisciplinary in the field of citizen science in particular, and we are applying sensor web enablement standards to, to, to the, that particular field to, uh, in, to uh, allow interoperation between the different citizen science projects. We are enabling data discovery too uh, by the use of standard catalogs like the catalog service for the web, the open search, etc. 
we allow data sharing and downloading, facilitating open access of features, coverages, observations, uh, sensor things, etc. We are using open infrastructures in a distributed processing federation uh, using standards like Docker and processing services. And we are able to overlay uh, data and visualize them and interpret them in open labs using maps and tiles and uh, other artifacts that we use in a standard way. And all of these concepts actually sound familiar, this findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reproducibility that conform the fair principles that the European Commission in particular is trying to promote uh, in the European level uh, science. It is all about combining different kinds of data in a single uh, environment. You combining perhaps remote sensing with airborne data, with uh, sensors on the ground, and with this uh, citizen that we see at the bottom uh, just in the field. And we do that by uh, not just uh, applying uh, technological standards uh, and protocols, but also to applying common vocabularies that we can share all together uh, to describe the observer, to describe the phenomenon they observe, and to describe the properties that he is able to see uh, about the phenomenon that he is interested in, such as rain, uh, so fluxes, and quantities in this case. And all of this is to create knowledge uh, for informed decisions, so to transform the maybe too big data into digestible information that then uh, can be uh, enough analyzed to be converted into knowledge. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so, you can see that we're, we're going, we're talking about ethics and e equity, and we're talking about um, very complicated and, and sophisticated technologies to make things happen. Um, and the next speaker we've got um, is, is Pen Yuan Hing, and he's going to take over the screen and give us an, an example, a particular example of, of citizen science and open science working together. Thank you, Pen. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really privileged to be the co-founder of the MammalWeb project where we worked with citizen scientists over the past five years on wildlife monitoring. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that when it comes to citizen science, it's much more than just citizens collecting data for scientists, right? It's also about how science can help all of us be more engaged citizens. And it is this relationship between science and citizenship and how open science enables that relationship, those are the things I'm really interested in. But rather than using my example, uh, I'm going to use one from my home country of Taiwan that is somewhat relevant to the times we live in. So like most uh, of the world, Taiwan has been dealing with the COVID-19 disease since um, the beginning of 2020. And since Taiwan has uh, experience with multiple respiratory illnesses, there is already widespread um, public adoption of wearing face masks. Now, this is not you know, to prevent you from getting a disease, but it's more importantly to protect other people in case you are infected, right? Now, when COVID-19 became a problem, uh, a lot of people started panicking, right? Uh, on social media, you could see lots of people frantically trying to figure out where they can still go to buy masks. So this was noticed by a citizen science network in Taiwan called GovZero. And they were like, you know, hey, rather than keeping all of this on social media, you know, let's build a mapping platform where anyone can report in on which stores still had masks, right? And uh, this became an instant sensation um, gaining millions of users practically overnight, um, just using the crowdsourced data. And uh, the organizers actually had trouble 
uh, keeping up and paying for all of the hosting costs. So to scale this up, GovZero reached out to Taiwan's digital minister who incorporated the mapping platform into a new national face mask rationing system. And uh, this new rationing system distributed face masks exclusively uh, through pharmacies. And this is because of Taiwan's single payer universal health care that has a existing database on what kind of products pharmacies keep in stock. And what this meant was that once someone swipes their health insurance card to buy a mask, that amount is deducted from this open database. And, um, and by combining the crowdsourced mapping platform and the national database, um, anyone with the internet connection can now get near real-time updates on where to go buy masks. So since this program began in the uh, beginning of February, which was one month before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, Taiwan has moved with the help of these citizen scientists uh, from initial signs of panic buying to having a stable supply of face masks for everyone to now having such a big surplus in production that more than 30 million of them have been donated globally as humanitarian aid to places such as the US or the EU. I'm also uh, relieved to report that um, with the uh, citizen science efforts and a lot of other aggressive preventative measures, Taiwan has gone uh, uh, since April with zero confirmed local cases of COVID-19. Now, um, I think this example really demonstrates citizen science as a form of participatory democracy that can influence government policy. And one key to its success was a dedication to open science principles uh, by the citizen scientists, but also by Taiwan's government. And um, whether it's from the crowdsourced data to the national health database, to the software code underlying uh, the mapping platform, everything was released under open source licenses. And these licenses were crucial because they give everyone the freedom to share, to study, remix, and adapt the material to suit different needs. Uh, for example, uh, one uh, app that I really like is this automated chatbot on social media where you can ask it questions on the availability and the use of face masks. So I think Taiwan's um, experience shows us this virtuous cycle between citizen science, open science, and open governance that can really create a lot more civic innovation. Uh, so that's just a really quick summary. And um, I really look forward to your feedback and learning more from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Penn. Um, I know I constrained you to doing something you weren't necessarily um, wanting to do, but I thought, think that's such a brilliant example. It ju it's just one very clear demonstration of what can be done um, in, in collaboration, um, working across, uh, all, instead of silos, um, as Joanne said, working together. Uh, excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, now, if I can ask uh, Shannon to un unmute herself, um, and I'll take over the screen again to to be able to show you her presentation. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, this was great. We, I mean, we had what twenty minutes and covered literally so much territory um, <laughs> with those three talkers. Uh, the three speakers. Um, so thanks so much for having me. And I've been asked uh, to try to talk um, and frame my comments around the intersections of citizen um, and community science and open scientific hardware, which is um, one of the things that I've incorporated into my work over the years. 
Um, so uh, as Libby mentioned, I was the executive director of Public Lab for a decade, um, and Public Lab focuses on using open technology to support communities in, address, um, in addressing environmental challenges. Um, and also along with a group of others, including uh, Francois Gray, who spoke earlier, uh, in about 2015, I started um, forming the Gathering for Open Science Hardware as a space where people could connect projects across the sciences that are using uh, open hardware um, to do scientific exploration. Um, and kind of coming out of uh, a decade and you know five years of building in open technology practices, um, it started to become very evident to me that there are some issues we need to overcome um, in the ability to really move community scientific data to places of impactful, um, that are impactful for decision making and setting policy agendas in support of local priorities. Um, so that is why I have moved into a fellowship with the Shuttleworth Foundation and working on a new project, the Open Environmental Data Project. So um, a couple of quick points that I am going to touch on. Um, I wanna talk just a bit about the value of open hardware specifically for citizen science. Um, and thus the value of open hardware for a broader open science agenda. And then also some of the challenges that we're collectively facing um, as we're thinking about the implementation of open scientific practices. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I love this picture. This picture is an absolute favorite of mine as I think it completely encapsulates the wonder and the power of making tinkering and building as a very key part in understanding the scientific process. Um, and so just a bit about open hardware before I go into kind of the value of it. Uh, open hardware argues in short that plans, protocols, and material lists for scientific instruments should be shared, accessible, and able to be replicated. So the importance of open hardware is that a lot of modern scientific equipment is a consumer product that is patented and not supplied with full design information information which makes it very difficult to repair and then it also thus blocks creativity and the ability for people to customize it. So the value of open hardware for citizen science is um, pretty significant and we're increasingly seeing citizen science and especially citizen science for education incorporate open hardware projects into their activities. Why? Uh, so open scientific hardware can provide more equitable access in educational contexts. Um, science hardware is available at lower cost, has local availability, for instance. If something is black box, meaning you can't take it apart, you're not able to open it up and teach your students or others that are working on a citizen or community science project about the tools that they're using. And if they don't know how the tools work, they have no way to check if what the tool is outputting is accurate. So for instance, if it needs to be recalibrated, usually you can tell that, you know, as an experienced person who's been doing this kind of work, um, readings will look odd, uh, but students and others that are new to using hardware tools and their citizen monitoring don't yet know what odd looks like. So it also can give people autonomy to intervene as part of their personal learning, uh, placing independent thinking and hands-on activities as central parts of robust learning practices, both formally and informal settings as well. Next slide, please. All right, um, and just on the left, this is the manifesto, and I guess I would kind of clarify that as the set of values that the, um, the global open science hardware or the GOSH community um, tries to emulate. And um, the, the value then of open hardware for broader open science agendas um, are that discovery and innovation have um, long been aided by scientific hardware. Um, and thus we really think that open hardware should have a pretty significant place on open science agendas um, because despite really big advances in technology, many scientific endeavors are being held back by the lack of access to hardware for even routine experimental techniques. And this ends up limiting the ability of groups to engage in scientific processes, especially groups outside of well-funded institutions and large research projects. Um, I think also there's a lot of people that have touched um, from Anna to uh, Marina on um, the, the core importance of equity. Um, so that I'm really happy to hear that as we're talking about open science in general. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, just generally equitable approaches are always present, are always present in open hardware um, that don't end up leaving out a majority of the world. 
And I think in the community of open scientific hardware, we're already showing that it is truly global. Um, so from GOSH, which has had three global gatherings uh, that have had people from 40 different countries come, uh, we have also had offshoot regional communities start, such as Africa Open Science Hardware and the Latin American REGOSH, uh, which have emerged over the last several years. And in recognition of the different needs and priorities of our regional variations of people who are using open science hardware, this means that we're embedding different practices and priorities that we've outlined um, in this slide. And that includes things such as, and I appreciate Mariana for having touched on some of these as well, uh, prioritizing local knowledge, expertise, and cognitive justice, having equity embedded in the actual design of tools, um, Tools are locally accessible and are customizable based on the needs of local priorities. Um, there are larger communities developed around the support of technology. Many times they are very low cost. And open hardware can also improve knowledge transfer, international collaboration, and accelerated innovation. And next slide. And hopefully final, I think. Great. And then just a couple of challenges, um, you know, one of the reasons that I've kind of moved into this new area in my work, um, so things that we need to be thinking about as we're implementing open hardware and even as we're thinking about um, how we're using citizen or community science uh, to achieve different kind of levels and, and goals um, from the community level. Uh, so being able to address policy standard setting and the ability of community data to be used beyond education, engagement, and basic research, and into the realm of supporting communities and policy setting um, really should become a priority for how we're thinking about how data moves from communities and these citizen monitoring projects to impactful decision making. We also have spent a lot of time over the last decade um, creating a, uh, a culture that is driven by technology innovation, but not creating a matching policy culture um, that upholds the kind of technology that we're creating. So we have a, a pretty significant mismatch. We also should be thinking about um, across all of these projects, citizen science, open hardware, et cetera, developing interoperation of systems for data, documentation, and hardware. And then also conceptualizing governance models um, that are conducive to multiple projects, data streams, and places of input um, as we see an increasing number of open hardware, citizen science, community science projects. And last slide. Okay, this is, I have to say, um, I was asked to have a picture of myself. I would never do this otherwise, so I'm a little embarrassed, but that's a picture of me, and here's all my links. <laughs> Um, this is my contact information, uh, but also just to point out um, information on my project, um, Gathering for Open Science Hardware, and then I also included a couple links to the Journal of Open Hardware. Um, so this is a hardware focused on, uh, you know, research related to open hardware. We also have a Medium page, so if you're kind of new to this, I suggest taking a look there because we have a lot of really publicly accessible pieces that are coming out about, you know, social construction around open hardware and whatnot. All right, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. That's um, that's fantastic, and thanks for putting details of, of things so people can uh, research more into it. I'd just like to say again that it's um, I'm really sad that we did we did, haven't had time to put up Leslie Chan's video, but we will actually put it on the um, in in the session recording because it's it also adds another facet to this wonderful presentations that we've had tonight, today, good, this morning, whenever it is where you are. Um, so I'll hand over to Anne now for the second Q&A session, if I may. Thank you very much, Anne. Thanks, Libby, and thanks everybody for those presentations. Um, and thanks, Shannon, for setting expectations for how engaged and awake we should all be on the East Coast of the United States. So I have a couple cross-cutting questions for the panel. I've noticed a couple questions coming in to the chat. If attendees are willing, we'd love to see more questions asked through the chat, including questions that are relevant to multiple presentations. So please feel free to make your contributions. So kicking off everyone who contributed to this round of talks, from your perspective, what are the tensions between citizen science and open science agendas? Are there areas where the two approaches differ or even con conflict? Uh, 
I'll just make a quick comment. Um, I, I'm not, I'm definitely not saying that citizen and community science are perfect in this realm. Um, but I think that, you know, as we saw um, a decade ago in the open gov, gov 2.0 movement, um, open does not necessarily equal accessible. Um, I think citizen science has been doing a lot of work um, to create accessibility. And um, I saw a couple of comments in the, the sidebar um, during this chat earlier that were, you know, talking about how um, a lot of open science is still kind of operating um, in these atmospheres of higher level research. So I think we just need to be very aware um, that, you know, we can open up as much as we want, um, but that we also need to be thinking about principles of accessibility um, so that we can truly create equitable forms of science. Um, I can also say something. Um, also, uh, it, it, is all, it is always about sim the similar issues of equity, but uh, the, um, in the discourse, it's, um, we all agree that uh, valuing different ways of knowing or different sorts of knowledge is okay. But in practice, those who have the power decide what is legitimate and what is not. And uh, despite the, the, the best intentions and the best policies or statements are written, uh, that doesn't uh, an alarm. That doesn't take um, place in practice. So I think a very big challenge for both the citizen science and the open science uh, movements is to figure out ways to really break uh, this fact that the those with privilege or those we already have the power and the resources continue benefiting more of these things than those who don't. Um, I don't have the solution, I just have the request. <laughs> just if I may also uh, from, from our side and what we've seen from, from the discussions, this is um, actually some of the key issues that have been discussed in, in all the different fora. Uh, one is this issue, of course, of, of, of equity, and as uh, Mariana very eloquently put it, both in her presentation and now in her uh, reply, it really is important to break this, uh, this, this, this cycle of, you know, power versus um, access to, to, to knowledge. But the other thing really, and this is what we're trying to get through uh, with this transformation of scientific culture is really, and that goes along with what Shannon uh, just said, is that there is a, a real need to transform the way in which scientific uh, outputs, let's say, are evaluated, scientific careers are evaluated. Uh, as long as indeed we stay into the impact factor as the only way in which uh, scientific careers and scientific outputs are evaluated, it's very difficult both for open science and for citizen science to interact. So some of the most important I think recommendations in are in like um, actions in the recommendation are along those lines. The importance of having different evaluation and reward systems and really recognizing in the, those evaluations, um, these interactions with society in, in different forms and formats. So um, yeah, that, that's also coming up very strongly in the discussions that we've had so far. Um, I'll really quickly add that um, you know, uh, which is actually kind of ties some of the things people, different people said together, which is that Mariana briefly mentioned the idea of, you know, power and potential power dynamics and relationships here. And what I was talking about uh, kind of relates to that because um, when it comes to citizen science and open science, there is this importance of um, realizing uh, that in the process of deriving knowledge, whether it's the scientific data we collect uh, the material we publish, media, uh, or even software and hardware, uh, all of this represents a, no a lot of knowledge, and that knowledge is power. And uh, to uh, democratize and equalize that power, I think that's where the concept of um, free culture, which um, Libby mentioned earlier uh, that I care about, comes in. And there is this definition for free cultural works, which means that um, for in, something to count as free culture, including open science, it has to have uh, four freedoms. Uh, the first one is the freedom to use for any purpose. The second one is to study it. The third one is to be able to share it. 
And the fourth one is to be able to uh, remix it, adapt it, and share those derivative works. Uh, this is closely tied to a lot of the work that the Creative Commons is doing. And Lawrence Lissick has written a lot about this. And um, the challenge, I think, um, is that uh, the current legal uh, and institutional uh, policies are not very conducive to ensuring and protecting these freedoms, uh, because whether that's copyright or patents and a lot of other laws, it assumes a very closed and proprietary nature of knowledge that concentrates power. So I think we really need to think about uh, this in terms of the legal and policy aspects as well. Uh, and one solution out of many is the use of um, licenses that ensures these freedoms because these licenses act within the current legal frameworks, but they um, uh, expressly give everyone the freedoms that I just talked about. Yeah. That was a great discussion. Thank you. And um, some great supporting comments in the chat. Juan, do you have anything to add before we move on? I was, I was trying to say that uh, I believe scientists now uh, are good for open science, but just at the end of their research period. So they release their data, they are comfortable with that, but what happens meanwhile? And in citizen science, we are we, we, we are actually teaching them that it is possible to release data while you acquire that. And this, this, this is demonstrated that there are two levels here uh, and how to cons reconcile those practices is part of the problem. Thank you for that. So my, my second question for the panel is a more practical one. What steps are required to further enhance collaborative citizen science and open science agendas? This is sort of your Twitter length takeaway. What, what would you like us to, to learn? Well, at least we are, we are trying to promote the same standards uh, used in, in, in science, uh, in government, and uh, now also in citizen science, this is this is something that we are trying to to promote from the We Observe project, and uh, this is going at least take, from the technical point of view. Uh, allow this is going to allow us to to combine those those things together. But of course, technical problems are just one side of the of of the question. Would anyone else like to come in? Yeah, I um, I saw Luki's comment in the chat and just I want to do my Twitter length on that, that um, we still both within citizen science and open science have some significant work to do in these disciplines on um, culture change and power shifting. Um, you know, a lot of what we're still talking about um, still uh, involves very top-down practices. And so for what we're trying to accomplish and the goals that I think we've brought up in the chat and through speaking um, is still going to take significant work on behalf of this global community to achieve. I think it's uh, more of the same on, on a different perspective. In this process of, of consultation about the UNESCO's open science recommendations, recommendations on open science, uh, being a bit more uh, open <laughs> and, and willing to be uncomfortable. Uh, all of us, I mean, not, not only you and here from UNESCO, but I think the more established organizations and associations and institutions to be more, more open to willing and listen to incorporate marginal, if you want, <laughs> uh, movements and processes. The example of Pen Yuan in Taiwan is great, and Karen Soacha just put here the example of Amelika, like thinking of open science from the Latin America perspective. I think we need to be able to incorporate those in a more effective way, even if they are not, maybe especially because they are not what we are used to. 
And I think it's, it's a call for us personally and not only institutionally being um, open and, and welcome to become un uncomfortable, like um, it's the, out of our comfort zones, out of what we know how to do, out of what is institutionalized. Thank you, Pen Pen Juan. Anything from your end? Oh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, say that, uh, to be emphasized that I think um, there should uh, be some effort that looks into the um, kind of policy and legal aspects of this and to see how we can work with it, but also potentially change it to more accommodate the equalization of this power relationship uh, in terms of all of the knowledge that's produced through citizen science and open science. Thanks for that. So I'm almost tempted to end there because those were such great takeaways, but it's always tragic not to let other people from the chat ask questions. So since equity and power was such an overarching theme of this talk, I will go ahead and read Mookie's question, which Shannon also referenced. What are the plans to deal with culture and power in the scientific enterprise that citizen science is challenging? For example, open access still keeps publishers in place editors that maintain discipline and professional barriers, and funding agencies that make sure that only tiny amounts go to citizen science. What are the cultural changes that we need and how are we going to achieve them? So a question and then also a, a rallying cry. I can maybe just very, but not, I don't have an answer to that very, very comprehensive question. And, and also I think there is a couple of people with their hands up in the, uh, on the video. Um, uh, just, just very quickly, I think it's a question also of dialogue between these different groups. What we've seen actually in open science, uh, as opposed to, let's say, more traditional science, is really that there are so many different actors and to have those cultural changes, there has to be changes in the way all these different groups are actually um, functioning. So there are already some very good initiatives in different countries where this dialogue is systematically now being uh, held to understand who needs to do what so that this global cultural systematic change can happen. And I think that's very, very important. And it's going to be a variety of different things. I don't think it's like one thing for every group and then you're going to have and in different setups in different countries, depending on where you're starting from who your actors are, what their issues are, where they're coming from. So it's, it's, a, it's a very dynamic dialogue that has to happen all the time across scales and take into account all the different pers perspectives of the different um, actors. Uh, I'll really, really quickly say something I try to always remind myself, and that's um, words matter. Uh, so as an example, just to really quickly address part of Moki's question, uh, about the tiny amounts of funding that go to citizen science, I often see people when they talk about citizen science, they use words such as, you know, it's for free, you know, it's volunteers doing stuff voluntarily. And that may be true to an extent, but our words matter a lot. And often it gives the message uh, that citizen science is all for free and it leads to a attitude sometimes where people take it for granted. And I think that's a problem. And, but anyway, my point is that I think we should also be careful about the words that we choose to talk about these things. Let me just add that there are good things already happening. Uh, and in the infrastructure point of view, we have this European Open Science Cloud that uh, is inclusive and uh, the commission is designing it inclusive and it's including citizen science on it too. Uh, and uh, that means that some things are, are already converging. So I know that we have a lot more questions in the chat and then Heiner, I also see that you've been raising your hand. I would actually ask you if you wouldn't mind to type your question in the chat. I've also been asked to um, give a summary of key items discussed, but this talk was so rich and we have a lot of things that we have talked about, but not necessarily unpacked fully. 
what I'm going to do is work with the organizers to, instead of giving a summary right now, since we're almost out of time, um, make sure that we're going through the chat to capture all key messages there, and then work with the interim co-chairs of the open science and citizen science community of practice to report back on the outcomes of the session, topics discussed, as well as open questions that both communities should be considering. But noting that we have one moment left, at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for their contributions and hand it back over to Libby. Thank you very much, Anne. I'm very glad you did that. I was so nervous about managing all the different <laughs> exchanges. I couldn't have, couldn't have done that. So thank you very much. I'd like to say on behalf of the, the co-chairs of the um, community of practice, Uta Wen and Claudia Goebel and myself, that we see what work is before us and it, it's, it's daunting in its complexity, but it's so exciting because of all the things that we've heard tonight, um, all of the different facets of it and the fact that people are inspired and energized by, by what needs to be done. Big challenges, no doubt, but with a community such as we have, and a community that's come together to work on this, I think the way forward is going to be a really, really interesting journey. Um, and I'd say to anybody who's at this session who would, might be interested that to, to get in touch with us, have a look at the uh, Citizen Science Global Partnership website and uh, look at the community of practice, see what's there, look at the UNESCO links and uh, do get in, involved with us. Um, if you're interested. And I'd like to say to our presenters, that was richer and, and more textured than I even thought it was. And I, I was pretty excited by the whole thing. So thank you very much uh, for being with us Th and to all the people who've attended. Thank you very much for being with us too. And I have to say a big thank you to the Exa guys and particularly Margaret, who's been my backstop. <laughs> Anne's been magnificent with the questions, but Margaret's been there looking after me with the technology. So um, everybody's been really helpful to us. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for this session and uh, very glad to have you with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good, Good morning. Good night. Cheers. <clears throat> Um, just quickly before everyone logs off, is it possible to um, get access to the slideshow? We're going to do, um, the, the session's being recorded, okay. so we'll put that on, on the website and we'll also put on um, Leslie Chan's presentation, which is really interesting, yeah. so everybody should have a look at that too. So yes, you will we'll have the opportunity. Awesome, thank you very much that um, with, to everyone who registered just to make sure that you all have it in your inboxes so you don't forget as I know that I would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah and just really quick I've uh, posted links to my slides in case anyone want to you know critique it and give feedback. Thank you. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I was going to ask you Pen Yuang yes. Mm -hmm. About this, uh, you you put on the bottom of your slides the Creative Commons bits and pieces. So um, I don't know how to do that, or whether other people would like that. But it, it, I'd like to know more about it. So maybe you can help me with that one. Ah, okay. Uh, I'll try to do this uh, 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 succinctly. Um, so uh, what happens is that whenever you create something you know, literally anything, right? When you write something, when you write an email, when you record a video, record a sound, whenever you publish something, there is this legal assumption uh, that it's all restricted and all rights reserved by default and no one can make use of it. So if I take a picture online, right? And then I put it in my slideshow, that is technically illegal by default. And uh, the way the Creative Commons licenses work is that whenever you create something, if you attach one of the licenses to it, you are legally expressing the, um, the, 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 the conditions that go with your work. So for instance, if you look into my slides, all of them come with Creative Commons licenses where the creators have said that, yes, I allow you to use this picture or this thing for the following purposes in the following ways. 
and the Creative Commons licenses are a way of standardizing uh, a way of expressing those, um, those terms, if that makes sense. And it's meant to make uh, the flow of knowledge and material um, uh, more, more easy and free. But not necessarily free of charge, but free as in, you know, freedom to share things. But you think that's a good thing to put on all of the things that we share with people then, so they know it's okay? Yes, so I always try to do that. So when people see my stuff, right, they know exactly how they can use that material. Because, and they don't need to come to me, uh, which saves yeah. a lot of time and effort because, you know, you don't need to email me and saying, hey, Penn, can I use your stuff for this purpose? because I've already given you permission yeah. to do so. I'm very thank sorry you. to interrupt you. I'm afraid I need to close the channel now, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this really rich conversation. And I'm able to save the chat and share that with the organizers and speakers so that they can continue to engage with the questions and, and, uh, and, and work those into your, into your shared thank documentation you. from here on in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so cool. much. Thank you so thank much, you. Margaret. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh. Good night. Good day, wherever you are. Bye. Bye.